Good evening and welcome to Tainted Histories, Tabitha Rezer. Uh, in this event tonight, we'll watch two works by Tabitha Rezer um, and discuss this uh, together with our guests that I will introduce in a minute. My name is Rosa Wevers, I'll be your host for tonight. And uh, tonight's event is part of Rainbow's End, an event uh, and a series of events organized by Creative Coding Utrecht. And in the coming next weeks, and uh, there's a lot of things you can do. You can visit workshops and look at online lectures that are, are part of this, this event and this festival, which aims to uh, give a platform to creative coding, creative artistic practices, and especially uh, puts to the center, center underrepresented perspectives of uh, femme and queer people, of people of color, who all will work with digital and artistic practices. There's many things to see, so definitely check out the website of uh, Rainbow's End. And the second organizer of today's event is Impact Center for Media Culture in Utrecht. Um, they are also uh, exhibiting works by Tabitha Reser that you can visit once the measurements allow us to do so. In the meantime, you can also go to uh, reser.impact.nl, which is a web program in which there's many things to see. You can learn more about Tabitha's work and also um, check, out, uh, check out her works and uh, check out the videos. Um, yes, so, uh, so let's start. As I said, today we'll be screening two works by Tabitha Reser, Same Sex Biz and Sugar World Steerdom. And I won't be doing that alone. I'm very pleased to announce Camille Barton, who is joining the conversation uh, with me today. Camille is an interdisciplinary artist, an educator and an embodiment researcher who uses Afrofuturism to imagine creative interventions to, to systemic change. And their work brings together, um, amongst others, uh, dance, clowning, DJing, uh, and embodied research. So I would like to welcome you, Camille. Oh, and I forgot to say that you're also the head of the Equalities of Transformation Master that will start at the Sandburg very soon. Mm -hmm. So very welcome. Thank you. And as an introductory question, I would like to ask you, Camille, do you remember the first time that you encountered the work by Tabitha Reser? Yeah, um, I believe I first saw Tabitha's work in 2017 um, at an exhibition at Ugly Duck in London, which is a sort of gallery space near London Bridge. And they were doing a lot of kind of audiovisual work. And I remember seeing one of Tabitha's films, and I can't remember the exact name now, but it was really striking to me how much depth she could go into around colonization, but to kind of play with the themes of this in quite a light way that I hadn't come across before. So I'm, yeah, really pleased to get to be in conversation with you today about the work. Yes, that sounds wonderful. And I recognize that a bit. I think for me, the first time I saw Tabitha's work was in The Hague a few years ago, and I was thinking a lot about technology, actually, and how we tend to think of technology as something that is very objective, mm -hmm. but actually how it is a very political thing mm -hmm. that is very much embedded in all these different power structures. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, Tabitha Reser's work uses a feminist perspective, a decolonial perspective, and does that in a way that just embodies all these complexities in a very strong visual image. Yeah. And that was so refreshing to me that somebody managed to bring that all together and also use the visual language of internet culture that is also, mm -hmm. at least to me, something I, I, am, 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 I am encountering every day almost. So it felt mm -hmm. like also my, uh, where I live most, a big part of my life online also, mm -hmm. uh, was really taken seriously by this artist and, and uh, looked at in a very critical manner. So that's, yeah. that's what inspires me a lot about uh, Tabitha's work. Um, and that is, yeah, I think, I think what uh, Reser's work very much characterizes is how she um, manages to embody all these contradictions that we find in the digital culture of today. Um, she has a lot of attention for power structures. She looks at histories. She understands technologies not as something to be completely existing in a vacuum, but really thinking through the histories of explo exploitation and exclusion that they are connected with. Um, and she breaks through binaries, I think. So she dares to say, well, why don't we think about spirituality and technology together? Why do they have to be separate things? And I think in doing so, um, she's really important artist of today. Um, Tabitha Reser is not, not only an artist, uh, she's a healer um, and many things more. She's based in French uh, Guyana. And um, 
I really liked uh, about her own work. She says she works with screens, screens and energy streams. Um, so she's working in all these parallel uh, networks and, 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 and contexts. And she has described herself as infinity carcerated into an agent of healing who uses art as a means to unfold the soul. So I think that gives us a lot of context uh, to think through today. Um, and um, in this event, we will explore some of the larger questions that Gezer's work asks. And one of the things that I think we'll be focusing on is also some of the contradictions that we can find in cyberspace today and on the internet. So on the one hand, the internet is very much a space where people can get educated, where people can connect, find new communities. Um, on the other hand, the internet is also a space of violence, of harassment, a space of uh, extreme unsafety, especially for people who don't inhabit uh, masculinity, uh, being cisgender, able-bodiedness, uh, whiteness. So especially for those people, it is not so much always a safe space. And I think that contradiction that we find in the internet today is something we'll explore a bit further today. And we'll start with the work uh, Same Sex Biz, which is a work from 2014. In this work, we see a collage of diver diverging views on homosexuality in various African countries. Uh, we see people dancing, we see activists who are speaking and talking about the rights and the discussions surrounding those rights on the African continent. And before we'll watch this video, I would also like to give a warning because this video contains homophobic language, which is something that Tabitha in her work quite explicitly makes aims to make a critical invention, intervention into. Uh, so she critiques that and she wants to make visible the complex situation that met many people of the LGBTQI community face today. Um, but be aware that, that this also contains some homophobic language in that. The video takes about six minutes and we'll see you right back after. We have just seen Same Sex Biz by Tabitha Rezer. And in this video collage, she brings together all these different discourses and views um, and raises a very important question at the end, which is what if, is, if it is not homosexuality, but homophobia that was important to Africa? And in raising that question, she draws a connection between homophobia and also colonialism. Um, Camille, what do you take out of this question? How should we read this question? I think that Tabitha is trying to kind of leave some breadcrumbs for people to investigate the history of colonization and the gender binary because something that isn't spoken about so much is the fact that before colonization in many different nations in the African continent there were sometimes three or four different gender categories. For some of my Yoruba ancestors we have about three or four. Um, the Ibo people of Nigeria also would have female husbands where um, people would be taking on different kind of gender roles and so this idea that homosexuality or gender diversity didn't exist um, is part of actually the severing and the kind of import of Christianity and missionizing that's an ongoing um, reality on the continent and so I think Fabita is kind of naming this so that people mm -hmm. can maybe reflect and question the ways that the Western world currently positions itself as like so far ahead and so progressive around um, sort of LGBTQIA plus freedoms um, when actually in many other parts of the world and still to this day there's a much wider range of gender diversity outside of the binary um, and that the West does play a direct role in kind of interrupting and severing those connections. So the particular form of uh, homophobia that she's addressing here is very much connected to that colonialism. Yeah. 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 And so I think what's interesting today is also how there are many organizations that try to improve the situation of LGBTQI persons in the world. Mm -hmm. But by doing that, they sometimes tend to impose in these, this Western view on gender identity, sexual orientation upon other countries and mm -hmm. thereby also erasing these uh, these these identities or these ways of identifying? Yeah. Is that something that you recognize? I recognize that. I think there's a sort of ongoing legacy of colonization is, is kind of saviorism, yeah. you know, kind of white saviorism, whether it's in the form of individuals where we see quite young people who will go over to the African continent or other parts of the world and believe that at 18 years old, you know, they have exactly what's necessary to help 
people without necessarily having the skill sets or really knowing on the ground what's going on. And equally with organizations, there can be a sense of um, still maintaining that kind of benevolence, the feeling like we can save you, we know what's best for you. But often these organizations don't actually look at the history of what's happened and take responsibility for repairing some of the harm and for also giving people the information about what's happened because we see the perspective of the one of the men in the videos who's who's talking about it being an abomination and using this language which is really coming from the evangelical church mm -hmm. and he's probably not aware of his own sort of indigenous history yeah. and so I feel like it would be really powerful if organizations that were trying to help also were giving a historical overview of all of our roles in this and kind of how we've gotten to this point rather than pretending like we have all the solutions and the answers without looking at where the harm kind of came from. Exactly, so it's really understanding these different histories and, and powers of exclusion that are interconnected and mm -hmm. I think yeah, that's really also what the Vita's work allows us to see how these things are connected yeah. um, and being repeated throughout, uh, throughout today still. Mm -hmm. um, all right, we're now going to turn to a second uh, work by Tabitha Reser, uh, which is called Sugar Walls, Teardown, a work from 2016. Um, and in this work, Reser uh, researches the politics of technology and its relation to histories of exploitation. And there's some connections that we will later on also trace with the video that we've just seen. Uh, and specifically, this video makes visible how black Wemex bom uh, booms and bodies were used and exploited for Western science. Um, and this is a history that a lot of people are not aware of, actually. So it's also very much written out of the stories and the narratives that we have around technology. Um, and with this work, Tabitha traces these histories and, and gives a form of visibility to these women um, that, uh, that I think will raise a lot of questions. So let's watch um, Sugar Wells Dear Them. We've put, just watched Sugar Wells Dear Them by Tabitha Reser, which starts with a very important history lesson and ends with a moment of womb wellness. So I would be curious to hear if you at home also give yourself a hug. And now I would like to introduce Camille, who will give a response to the video. Thank you. Yeah, I got so much from watching this and the second time there's just still a lot that comes through. Um, I think the contrast between the kind of playfulness of the bright colors and the kind of animated 3D um, visuals is a beautiful way to allow quite heavy subject matter to come in in a way that doesn't feel confronting. Like so often um, when we are learning around colonialism or medical apartheid and the themes that are kind of explored in the film, um, there can be quite a heaviness and seriousness that can make it hard for people to really take in. And what I love about this work is that it's really bright and almost like sugar pop bubbly, but whilst allowing you to kind of go on this journey through some quite heavy and really important themes that need to be interrogated more um, for us to really situate ourselves to where we are in this moment and how we got here. And I think, yeah, something that really jumped out with me at the beginning with the opening with the kind of all the gynecology chairs that are so mass produced and really plastic and kind of gross looking, um, to me it really signals just how colonized our reproductive health system is at this stage and how medicalized it is and how much it's really in the hands of uh, predominantly kind of white Western medical doctors um, who are male for the most part. Um, and this kind of makes me think a lot about the work of Silvia Federici, Caliban and the Witch, sort of talking about um, how the witch burning times uh, were really gave rise to kind of modern capitalism as we know it. And part of this transition really involved taking away medical power um, from women, from midwives and female herbalists, who up to that point would actually provide the majority of kind of medical care for people in the European context. But any woman that was uh, labeled as a witch, which tended to be these women that were providing herbal knowledge or uh, birth work skills, a lot of them were, were burnt and killed at the stake. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands of women, and we don't really talk about that history of the European context. Um, and this really gave rise to um, the male-led kind of medical profession as we know it, because doctors were actually the, the witch hunters. 
They often were, were aiding in um, capturing and kind of labeling women as witches and burning them. So we can really see that that history has given rise to this moment we're in now where, um, you know, despite being half of the population of the world, we don't really understand the birth process. We often feel like birth is something that, um, you know, is a medical emergency rather something than something our bodies know how to do. Um, and any kind of reproductive health interventions are still unfortunately um, not really based around the kind of sacredness and sanctity of um, femme and gender non-conforming bodies, uh, but so much of it is structured around convenience uh, for kind of the male medical establishment. Um, and this serves to kind of, I think, reproduce a sense of us not really seeing our wombs um, or our centers of gravity or our bodies as sacred. And I think this is something that Tabitha really raises in a very beautiful and powerful way. Um, the last thing I want to say about wombs, though, before we move on, is I was looking at some research from Arizona State University where they were looking at uh, the impact of removing the uterus from rats. And they found that when they removed the uterus from rats, it affected their memory. They couldn't actually find their way through a maze um, that they were able to find their way through before the uterus was removed. So this is kind of the first inroads into Western science acknowledging that the womb and the uterus is not just a baby machine, it actually has a massive function that links to the brain, that links to memory and our sense of situating ourselves in the world. So I found that really interesting too. Another thing I was struck by in the film was the parallel between the exploitation of the African continent and wombs and femme bodies generally, uh, particularly black, black women's bodies as well throughout history and how this links to our current current system of racial uh, capitalist patriarchy and the dominance that we see in so many ways to particular groups of people. Um, Tabitha also mentions James Marion Sims, who's the in inventor of gynecology and that really, yeah, horrific um, history of experimentation on black women's bodies. And also um, a book that kind of speaks to this more as Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington, which also talks about people like Henrietta Lacks, which is also something that Tabita mentions, um, this kind of immortal cells that were taken from this black woman in the 50s um, that has allowed us to kind of sequence the hum human genome project and so many medical scientific advancements. And yet we're not taught that at school, right? It's not really included in our understanding of medicine and, and those developments. So we see this way that there's extraction from the African continent in terms of resource. There's been extraction from kind of black femme bodies without really any acknowledgement of where this wealth is coming from and where these advancements are kind of enabling us to go. And so there's a lack of kind of reciprocity and care and acknowledgement that we're still seeing in terms of the narratives we tell around our current history and um, and how we got to this moment. And um, yeah, so many things to say about this. But there's another aspect I want to speak to, which is um, how much this piece is around a call to kind of reconnect with the body and to reconnect with uh, the power of our bodies and embodiment as technology. So I love that um, Sabita kind of references dance and also meditation as two forms of kind of getting in touch with uh, what feels good within us, um, to get in touch with, um, yeah, our kind of intuition, gut feeling, as we call it, but literally the ways that our body can give us signals about how and where we need to move and what's safe and what we should avoid or pivot away from. Um, and I think it's fair to say that embodiment is a form of technology, one that we are beginning to circle back to and understand in a Western context. Um, because there's been a lot of separation with kind of Cartesian dualism and this idea that the body and mind are separate um, that has been really, yeah, dominant in the West for the last few hundred years. But with embodiment research and advancements in neuroscience, we're seeing that actually this is all connected and so much of our trauma really exists in the body and can only be moved or kind of healed or repatterned when we do embodied practices. And... Um, this is also fascinating for me in a lot of the work that I do in looking at kind of ancestral transmission um, of information and wisdom um, and how that can be accessed through dance and kind of trance states as well uh, in dance. And I think this is a really 
deep thread within the African diaspora of kind of movement forms that, that pop up that you see in, still in indigenous communities on the continent, but also that might come up in the Americas um, in black communities there. So I think that's, yeah, a really, a really important thread in, in the work that I do and think about. Um, it kind of pops up a little bit as well in my most recent film, The Grief Portal, which is trying to create space for people to connect to how they could locate grief in the body and to use movement as a way to, to work with that. So I see that parallel as well with this piece, which is, which is really nice. Um, the last thing I want to talk about thematically is also around how we perceive cyberspace um, and the way that because of these systems of kind of racial capitalism and patriarchy, um, we're often forced into interacting in certain ways in the internet, and we are yet to, I guess, explore the liberatory potential of how we could connect and interact in that space. Um, and there's some people who are really helping me to kind of expand my, my notions around this. One of these people is Nema Gitere, who's an indigenous Kenyan um, digital activist and curator, and Nema has a concept called Afropresentism, which is really about kind of using cyberspace as a way to connect to, again, ancestral wisdom, to use algorithms as kind of ways to facilitate intuition and, and kind of collective consciousness building. Um, and it was through Nema's work that I also became aware of this uh, critique of the difference between IRL and URL these ideas that we have that, you know, there's the real world and this is where real things are happening and the internet isn't really real, so we shouldn't take it seriously. Um, but Nibiru, who's one of the creators of Post Binary, which is a kind of trans music uh, collective for uh, people of color in the US, um, on their Instagram, I was seeing them kind of critique this and say, surveillance is happening in real life and also on the internet. Um, policing of certain bodies, silencing of certain bodies, things like doxing and these forms of data trauma, which is something else that Nema talks about, um, are things that are happening on the internet and reproduce the kind of violence that people experience in daily life who already are marginalized. So I think if we can kind of collapse those binaries and become a bit more intentional about how we uh, interact in online space, then we can use that as a site of liberation also. And I think that's what Tabita really speaks to in her work and demonstrates and how she structures things. Thank you so much. That That is really insightful. And I also see so many connections be, between your work and Tabita's work, which is really interesting to me. Um, a question I have, you in, in Tabita's work, we see that she says the womb is the original technology. And you're saying we should also think about the body as technology. Mm. Um, can you explain a bit more how how can we think about this 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 new new conception of technology, or maybe not mm. new? Yeah. What, I, what does it mean to you? I think to me it's again a, a practical way of um, decolonizing or re-indigenizing, mm. right? Of actually actively moving towards ways of being that have been severed since since the colonial project. And again, in Yoruba culture, which is part of my ancestry, um, there is a very different conception of the body. It's not seen as this kind of machine that just gets us from A to B. It's really seen as a vehicle for connection with the earth um, as a way to understand yeah, messages through our ancestors, a way to connect to four-legged kin, um, to really just inhabit space and time in a different way. And so I think a lot of the spiritual practices that Yoruba people have are really related to embodied rituals um, because the body is seen as, as a way to connect to spirit and kind of have that connection and the signals or sensations that we get kind of signaling that. And so in a way it can be seen as technology because it's, it's a way of giving and receiving transmission that goes beyond the kind of the westernized ideal of the self. Um, it's much more interconnected, a sense of being interconnected to the land and also working with plants, whether that's plants that are growing separately for us or what happens when we ingest them and these kind of interconnected life processes. And I think with the womb being a site of, you know, literally where life is created, um, it's just another facet of that, of kind of, uh, yeah, maybe a more specific part of the technology of embodiment. Um, 
And do you also see it as a different relation to the production of knowledge or the transmission of knowledge? I think that embodied knowledge is a type of knowledge production. Yeah. I think that, again, in the West, we kind of have a hierarchy of ways of knowing. And so the written word is really, really up there. We see that as like the most advanced and the thing we take most seriously. Whereas in a lot of other cultural contexts, oral transmission and embodied ways of knowing are just as valuable. Um, so I think that that's something, again, that's kind of shifting and we see sort of circling back with this trend of embodiment that's, that's uh, been taking place, particularly since the pandemic, when I think people have been, um, at least in the West, very much confined in certain spaces and probably confronted with like, oh yeah, I have a body and it hurts or it's uncomfortable or what am I going to do with this? Whereas living in a very fast paced kind of industrial uh, situation, we're really, we've been actively conditioned to disconnect and dissociate from our bodies. And so I think it's normal for many people in the West to not actually feel very much about what's going on in there. But I know for me, in the years I've been moving more towards dance as healing tools and different forms of embodiment practices, I'm much more keyed into the different sensations and signals that I'm receiving. And when we hear stories of indigenous peoples, I mean, there are even deeper, way deeper connections that um, many still have, whether it's to do with like sensing the rain that's going to come or being able to sense into different directions, things which would seem fantastical to us, but mm -hmm. were very commonplace and, and still are for some peoples in the world. Thank you. And I see in your work that you combine artistic practice, practice research, you say embodiment research, dance. Um, how are for you these things connected? Because I also trace it in Tabitha's work, mm. that she very much refuses to say, I'm only this or I'm only that and really work with those binaries, but actually she questions, seems to question it also through combining all these different practices. Mm. How do you uh, look at that? Sure. Um, yeah, I think for me, I've never been able to just refine my interest into one thing. And I used to give myself a hard time about it, but um, I'm much more accepting of it now. And I definitely see influences from kind of the creative realms, but also I'm deeply interested in politics and yeah, different perspectives of history. Um, ultimately, I think that art and creativity provide vehicles to communicate things symbolically and emotionally that can't necessarily reach people in the way that written text does. Yeah. Some people can get a lot from text, and sometimes I do, but I think there are other ways to kind of digest and transmit this information that can be um, received very differently. And I'm quite interested in that, and I can see that in the way that Tabitha does her work too and, and ultimately I think these separations of different subjects are again um, very much linked to the colonial project even in the European context it was only within the last 100 years or so where a lot of subjects were combined together so you'd have for example political economy which was a mixture of economics politics sociology and the arts and people like Karl Marx and a lot of the theorists of that time were political economists um, because they had this interdisciplinary view that allowed them to see how things connected. But uh, in the early sort of 20th century, a lot of these things were passed out. And so you have much more silos of knowledge. But I think that these things always have connected and there's a power in being able to see the relationships between these different areas. So I'm, yeah, quite committed to continuing to stick my fingers in many pies. <laughs> What I also see in, in Tabitha's work is, is her focus on spirituality, which I find incredibly interesting. And I think throughout her work, in her, more of her latest work, it's, it's even more present there. Mm -hmm. um, and I also see a development in more activist movements where also there seems to be more and more awareness of the importance of, of healing, of care, mm -hmm. uh, also of spirituality in, in activist struggles. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you did you recognize and why do you think this development is, uh, is taking place? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think, I mean, I've always had that tension going on for me. Mm. Um, I feel like we're entering a moment where there's more permission to be open about being activist and also being spiritual. I didn't feel that sort of 10 years ago. I would often hide my spirituality when I was in activist spaces. But I think that we're in a moment where so much is being revealed, so many of the power structures at play, um, so much inequality that's been happening for a long time, but it's just very, very visible now. 
And I think people are realizing that uh, we need to not just say no to things, we also need to build new structures. Mm -hmm. We also need to heal and to create cultures of care that will allow us to transition from the place we're in now to where we want to go. Mm -hmm. And that's still a question mark, right? But it's hopefully something we can continue imagining and visioning and working towards. But that has to happen in a sustainable way. And right now, the ways we interact and operate are not um, generative for many of us, right? And we're really feeling that in the pandemic where so many of us are being reduced to just working <laughs> all the time. So I think this um, yeah, desire for spirituality is trying to find a different place to root and to grow so that we can yeah, situate ourselves in a different space. And I, I think it's really, I'm really, I really welcome it and I'm excited to see more people artists and activists and beyond kind of reclaiming that and trying to weave that into the work uh, that we're doing. Thank you. I think that's also interested, interesting in relation to the questions that we started also with this event, how the internet is both a space of connection, even potentially of spirituality, of healing, of connection, uh, something, a place where you can get educated, but on the other hand, also an extremely violent place, mm -hmm. a space where a lot of exclusion is also happening. And in your response, you had it. Uh, you talked about this uh, this difference between IRL and URL, mm -hmm. and it's something that I very much recognize. I think, especially the last year, I heard myself saying sometimes, "Oh no, but that is taking place in real life." And then I was like, "Wait, but real life? Why am I still referring to real life as as, as something that defines the offline, mm -hmm. and then online being maybe not real?" And I think there's a big issue with with keeping into existence that, that binary because mm. as you also addressed it obscures some of the power structures that are really real and and the, the embodied effects also of of things that are happening online so mm. um, I'm very much interested and I would like to ask you what could be strategies for trying to search for for safe spaces on the internet or to approach the internet as a space where we can also connect and heal mm. what are some of the strategies that you are maybe yourself using for that? Yeah, thank you. I think I'm trying to take it a bit more seriously, like where my data is going and, and be more intentional about the kinds of connection that I want online and then find platforms that will allow me to feel enough trust to really share, um, I mean, my data, but also just of myself. Mm. Um, I am still on Instagram. I do still have a Facebook, but I notice increasingly that I don't really want to interact on these platforms. So I'm thinking about moving to Patreon and also I'm quite interested in um, technologies like Scuttlebutt and uh, Mastodon that allow you to kind of have distributed peer-to-peer um, -peer kind of messaging boards, which are encrypted and also allow that data to kind of live between your computers as an invite-only space. because. I think that it's not that people shouldn't use corporate platforms, but we just need to be aware of what we're really giving, which is, yeah, ourselves. We are the product um, in many of these spaces. So I think that's part of it for me. Also just digital security and trying to educate myself more around, um, yeah, just how to enact on, uh, safety online, um, whether that's having things like 1Password or using VPNs. And this is all quite new to me in the last few years but that's part of it and then I think also listening to people again like Nema Gitere who's thinking a lot around uh, data trauma and data healing mm. and really trying to articulate um, the need to understand the impact that the online world and cyber realm is having on our bodies and our, our real life experiences mm. right and part of that might be uh, making sure that therapists are aware of what doxing is you know, I'm, I have a few friends in my life who've been doxxed in the last year and it's genuinely scary and very traumatic for them um, to have their address out in the world, to feel like at any moment there might be a violation of their home space or, or something worse. So I think, yeah, just having intentionality to know, even if we are people that want to reduce our screen time and have more digital boundaries, that we take it seriously that this cyber realm also has a very tangible impact yeah. Yeah. on our day to day and how could we create digital spaces that allow us to have generative nourishing connections rather than thinking oh well it's not really real so you know we'll let anything fly and just starting to really see this as a site of transformation rather than um, a kind of 
being complicit in corporate capture and, and giving away the agency that we have to really allow this to be a liberatory space. I think that's a very hopeful and insightful perspective. And uh, thank you for providing us with some strategies of of uh, addressing these issues that we're facing, uh, facing today. Um, and that brings us at the end of uh, this event. Uh, thank you so much for listening and thank you for watching. Thank you, Camille. Your insights uh, were really inspiring to me. Um, also, thank you for the organizers and also the technical assistant that was here present um, by making this possible today. Um, if you would like to see more, you can check out uh, the Rainbows Ends Festival. Uh, there will be a sex tech, tech talk show soon. And there will also be a pop-up gallery at the center of Utrecht. Uh, so if you're around, make sure to check that out. And uh, yeah, I would like to thank you. <laughs>